Oh, uh, welcome back. Good times here in the studio talking about <laughs> marriage and money and, you know, when you got a bunch of married sitting around talking about it. It's lots of fun. Hey, uh, you know, Kirk Russell joins us for the first time from John L. Scott. Now, Kirk Russell is a member of John L. Scott's President Elite Club and a short sale specialist. Now, Kirk, uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, a little bit nervous. No, but... <laughs> you're doing good. You're doing great. Uh, so here's the, this is what I find interesting is you've actually worked with people who've fallen behind on their mortgages to over a million dollars. That seems like a lot. Um, not, 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 not necessarily. It depends on how you look at it. I've, I've done deals where a bank lost $2 million in one transaction. So it, it depends on what the intent is from the seller and how we can make it work for the bank. I mean, really, that kind of becomes the point, though. I mean, if you're behind that much, there's not a lot you can do to really make it a, make good financial sense for yourself. Well, the, the typical clientele that I represent, they're not necessarily behind. It's more of a strategic move. You know, you look at it from this standpoint. If, it, if you could stomach a credit hit, which a short sale will have some liability, um, it's more, well, do I pay my million-dollar home? And knowing that they market value somewhere around six to seven hundred or take a hit and work with the bank. So there's a lot of people capitalizing on the bank situation and moving towards a short sale. So they're not in a financially strapped position, can't afford food or, you know, basic cost of living. It's more uh business a business decision. And that seems to be what more and more people I mean the more people we talk to, it's kinda of like, well, I could pay my mortgage, but I'm, you know, three hundred thousand or more. Now granted this is changing now that the market's kinda of coming back a little <laughs> bit. But you know when people are way down, it, it it is a it's a business decision. A lot of these are business people making these decisions. Yeah, again, I generally I don't think any one of my clients you know truly can't afford a mortgage, to be honest. And working with hopefully in a, the short sale negotiator <laughs> isn't listening to this show right now. <laughs> um, ultimately, it comes down to you know trying to piece a situation together for the bank and you know the homeowner. So. Uh, it, it's it's more you know what is going to be the end result, and not every bank will release a homeowner from the debt. So if if it you know if if it comes down to selling a property, knowing that you're going to walk away on the bank fifty grand compared to you know negative five hundred thousand, that might make sense from the right perspective, because you could work with a bank and walk away and still owe the bank you know tons of money, and a lot of homeowners will look at that you know from a positive standpoint. And so it becomes this, uh, you know, the motivational factors really become kind of financial, not necessarily can't afford it. Typically, I, I've represented guys that have multiple properties, and they're just super extended. Now, they might make a million dollars a year, but they can't afford, you know, $20 million with a mortgage. So from that perspective, they're in a strapped position, just like anybody else that can't afford, you know, their basic cost of living. Uh, it, it's It's... I want to say not every situation is doable and not every seller should actually explore a short sale because if you're in a situation where you truly can't afford your mortgage, you might try to do a short sale and the end result may not be in your best interest. And now you have a credit damage and you're in a worse position than you started off from. So does it make a difference in a short sale on what maybe a, a seller can expect if they have more money than maybe somebody who's truly in financial distress? Is, there, is that a different scenario? Um, it's not necessarily a different scenario. It's just that you have to have realistic expectations. Uh, if you're making 20 grand a month, the bank is not going to just let you walk away, you know, scratch free. You may have to come up with some funds and, um, coming up with some funds might be easy for somebody to write a check knowing that they're going to get out of, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars with a bad debt. So the expectation of the outcome from a seller's perspective, it has to be realistic. And the and the I guess the seller also I mean if they're way behind or if they're if they're way underwater has the ability to walk and in a state like Washington with your first mortgage you know that doesn't really bode well for the bank either so there's kind of this financial decision to be made by the bank also to make sure that they can at least recapture some of it. Occasionally, like yeah, when the market was good, a lot of people did eighty twenty loans. They had the first and the second. So even in our state, you have a lot of homeowners that has a first and a second mortgage. So working with a bank in that scenario, it may not be, you know, a, a good result for the seller because they're still going to, you know, walk away and knowing that they're going to have to pay the second mortgage no matter what. So you typically will have a, a homeowner in a situation where they can't afford a loan. And it's honestly better for them to 
probably consider a bankruptcy doesn't work with their bank because the end result is not going to be, you know, truly debt free. So if they're not distressed and they're still paying the mortgage because they can afford it, what does that process look like? It, it's the same process as somebody that really can't afford their mortgage. Uh, same set of documents the bank is going to ask them for. They, the difference uh, when you go to the person that can make a decision at the bank is, you know, what makes sense? How much can we squeeze the homeowner out of? Uh, we see that the property is worth X amount of dollars, and we're going to get as much as we can get if we foreclose. But the homeowner might have 50, a couple hundred grand sitting in a bank or in investment. So they have the ability to come up with some cash or do a repayment plan for some of the money that's owed. So a bank could consider, you know, releasing the debt against the property and reducing the interest rate. So that is a win-win for both the homeowner and the bank. And so then you end up with like, I mean, it sounds like almost uh, like an installment debt of some sort that you, where you would pay it over time. Exactly. And uh, to, to give a homeowner incentive from a bank's perspective to go along with the process, typically they would even waive as much as 70% of the bad debt. So you could say, for instance, for a $200,000 second mortgage, walk away, you know, with a repayment plan on just a fraction of that you know, as little as 0% per month. Well, it seems that that would make a lot of sense. We're here with Kirk Russell with John L. Scott, uh, short sale specialist. Um, what about the people who have multiple homes? Well, again, if um, you truly can't afford your property and you're spread thin, you got rental rental income that's not covering it, you probably should look at some alternative, some workout. You can reach out to your bank. You don't necessarily have to do a short sale. Most banks will consider working with a homeowner to keep them in the property. And if they have multiple property, you know, they still could get a modification. It all depends on the bank's guidelines for that particular loan. So if you're spread thin, you definitely want to seek some really good advice from somebody that knows what they're doing. You know, that- yeah, you know, actually, well, yesterday we were talking about how a lot of people in, in, in all, all across walks of life uh, who don't have professionals they can count on, they don't even know what their options are. And we, we, I came to this from the mortgage side uh, where people don't, you know, if you don't have a loan officer who works with you consistently, it's kind of like your guy, then you may not know what these low rates can do for you. You don't even know the options available. Uh, I think the same can be said in, in the short sale world or in the real estate world where if you don't have a guy or a person or a gal that you can trust and you can go to, then it can be di- very difficult to even understand what your options are, let alone try to act, capitalize on one of them. That's totally true. Um, take, for instance, you know, you have a lot of attorneys that are in good, they're there to negotiate deals. With just about every bank, there's no negotiations. You know, to be honest, you just got to fit within the bank's guidelines and you're going to get an approval. But then you have an, a, a homeowner or even a broker referring, you know, a, a homeowner over to an attorney thinking that, okay, they're going to get a better service. I personally think a, a more a real estate broker should be able to negotiate a deal better than any attorney because that attorney is working with the same person that I'm going to call up. And the attorney has nothing to defend the homeowner from, especially if they're breaking a contract that they sign with the bank. So the attorney can't say, well, hey, you got to do this for my client. Now, if it comes down to where it's a first mortgage and there's a deficiency balance to address, an attorney might carry some weight. But in terms of getting an approval, a realtor should be able to pull off a better deal than any attorney, in my opinion. But maybe pull off a better deal, but certainly get the paperwork looked at by an attorney to make sure that any of those deficiencies are not there, right? No, that's a different side. That's the more going towards the closing of the transaction. Once you get an approval, I'm not an attorney. I can't, I'm, I can't give legal advice. And on top of that, I can't advise somebody on whether or not they're going to walk away and owe the bank, not the bank, but the IRS money on the money that the bank is losing. So definitely want to refer somebody over to say, hey, go seek some professional advice on that piece, whether or not you're going to have some liabilities or understanding the terms of the short sale. So it really sounds like not only can having somebody who's in your corner help you understand the options, but it's also the order of operations by which to go down a path efficiently and and correctly to to protect yourself. You you definitely want to take a, a, a good look at your financial picture, and you want to reach out and find professionals, not just... One person has said, well, I've worked on a, a 50 short sales. I want to make sure that that person has a good network of uh, qualified individuals that it could refer you to to address every different aspect that can come along in a short sale situation. It's a little bit more complicated than just selling my home for, you know, wanting to walk away. So when you got to deal with uh, banks that want a repayment plan, on top of that, whether or not you're going to be faced a tax liability on $200,000 with a loss, 
you definitely want to figure out your options before exploring a short sale. Well, it's good information, Kirk. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the first time again. Kirk Russell, John L. Scott Real Estate. We do have to go to break, but when we come back, Heather Moore is going to join us along with Kathleen Miller and Michael Busaka. We're going to talk more about making the right decisions. We'll be right back after this break. 